You know, friends, as I study the Word of God, I am, I am amazed and also perplexed at the current situation that we have today, where there's so many doctrines that are going around, and there's so many deceivers, but we know that this is what Christ told us, that in the last day there shall be many false prophets, and we'll be looking at that today we're looking at a very a doctrine that's very detrimental to one's spiritual health so to speak because it contradicts everything in the bible specifically the end time prophecies and this is none other than the teaching that there will be a secret rapture before we even get into that let's just define what rapture means well a rapture it's pretty much english derived from Middle French rapture, which means a carrying off or to be uh, kidnapped or taken away. So it simply means that uh, process. But when we study it in the biblical context, we find the word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4.17, and also it's used in verses such as Acts 8.39 and 2 Corinthians 12.2-4. Let's quickly... Uh, Take a look at those verses. The first verse says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's First Thessalonians 4.17. It speaks to this idea of uh, God's people, God's church, being caught up to meet Christ in the air. It is true that when Jesus returns, he will not touch this ground, but he will remain in the air. And then we, those who, who, are, who died in Christ, will rise. And those who remain in Christ, who are alive, will be caught in the air. So that is a biblical teaching. That has no problem. And then we read in Acts 8.39, And when we were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. This is fascinating. It speaks to the time when Philip was teleported literally from one location to the other for the purpose of ministry. That's how God takes his word seriously, understanding of his word seriously. We see this eunuch going on his way, but God teleports another person to explain to him what the word of God means, and he went away rejoicing. This was an awesome experience for him, and so will the second coming of Jesus be for those who have the hope of Christ's return in them. We read also in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2-4, where Paul speaks about the idea of being caught up to a third heaven. Moving on, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, now we're entering a prophetic realm because the book of Revelation is prophetic and you cannot take things in the book of Revelation literally but you have to understand it's prophetic some things have what they mean for instance the book speaks about beasts we cannot say that these are literal beasts because the bible then goes to explain what each of these items mean and so we see in revelation 12 5 that uh and the verse says and she brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron and her child was caught up unto god and to his throne now, Revelation 12 speaks about a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and she's so bright and glorious. And then she, she's, of course, definitely she's about to give birth. And we are told that the, the dragon sought to, uh, to, do, to kill the child. And of course, this is not, none other than the story of Jesus Christ, where when he was born, the devil sought to kill him because he knew that Jesus was going to save the world and the devil didn't want to do didn't want him to do that but we see jesus christ being caught up in the air where do we see that it's found in acts chapter 1 verse 11 and after jesus christ ascended the disciples were looking at that amazing ascension of jesus christ how could this man uh, of course they knew he was god how could he defy gravity and go up and so the, the angels say, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, not another one, but this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the return of Jesus will be something that's visible and audible. It will happen the same way. So there shouldn't be any room for any other interpretation that's not found in the word of God. Let's back off a little bit and think about these following verses or counsels and warnings that have been given to us. The first one is found in 1 Timothy 4.1 and it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some shall def- depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Today, as we speak in the, in the Christian world or Christendom, as you would like to say, um, there's so many doctrines. I would say a library and a library of doctrines. But how do you know what is truth and what is error? How do we know if these doctrines are not doctrines of devils? Remember, the devil is a student of the Bible. When he was tempting Jesus, he quoted scripture. And so we cannot say that everybody who's, who quotes scripture is saying the truth because even the devil quoted scripture. But we must compare scripture with scripture to verify if those things said are even so. And so Jesus warns us in regards to the end time events, when, when the disciples ask him, what shall, what shall happen in the, at the end of the world? What will happen? The first thing Jesus tells them is, and Jesus answered and said unto them, this is Matthew 24, 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. This is very important. If you do not take heed, you will be deceived. So you need always to be ready. Compare scripture. Do not take my word for it and do not take anybody's word for it, no matter who they are. Matthew 24, 11 clarifies, And many false prophets shall rise, this is Jesus speaking, and shall deceive many Many people will be deceived, not few, but many. And so majority and popularity cannot be our standard. We have to be rooted in the word and the word of God alone. Having said that, there's this uh, hype that's going on and um, I would say alarmism, but let's look at it. So this gentleman claims that, you know, uh, the, the rapture is real and it's you must be prepared. This is the year of, of preparation, right? But where is he getting these ideas from, right? We are not to, just to listen to him because he claims to quote scripture. We have to see what is he saying. And so, of course, we see that he quotes First Thessalonians 4.17, uh, which says that those who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord Amen. That part is correct. That's what the Bible says. But here's where we have a problem. It says, and I I quote, At the rapture, not everyone will hear the sound of the trumpet. Uh, Pause. Who say that? You or the word of God? It's not found in the word of God. The Bible clearly says that in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, as it says even there, for the for the trumpet shall sound now the bible said the trumpet shall sound it did not indicate anything other than the trumpet will sound so where do you get the doctrine that not everybody will hear the trumpet is that biblical it continues to say it will be audible only to the christians that's not biblical and as we've seen many other verses that contradict that whole idea and so what i want to 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 show you here is and i don't want to get deep into this is that Many people, they can preach the word of God, but also add things that are not in the word of God. And what that does is that it destroys the purity of the word of God. The word of God is pure and nobody should add or subtract to it. So this is the danger that we run into when we start, uh, you know, deviating from the word of God just a little bit. He says if the rapture doesn't happen in three years, then six years. If, if, if not that, it cannot exceed 10. But my question there is where, is, where are you getting all this information from? 
Is it biblical? Now, a person might claim the Lord showed me, and, I've, uh, and we hear this many times. The Lord showed me that everybody should repent um, before the 15th of this month, there was another, another person saying. Uh, and if you don't, uh, uh, these other adverse things will happen to you. Now, you may claim, yes, the Lord talked to me. But remember, the Spirit of God does not contradict the Word of God. Jesus said, I go so that I may send you, send you a comforter, and he shall guide you into all things. He shall guide you into all truth. He does not speak of his own, but he says that which I tell him. Meaning, the Spirit cannot contradict the, the, the Son, and the Son cannot contradict the Father. They are one. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they're all one. And so when we run away or deviate from the Word of God, there's so many, so many plethora of doctrines that pop up that are not found in the Bible. Let's, let's look a little bit deeper here. Uh, what do the uh, rapturists believe? Well, many things, but here are the main things. Number one, they believe that Christ's return will be in two stages. In the first stage, Christ returns to uh, rapture his church away and protect it from the tribulation that will happen for seven years, in which they say the Antichrist, which is mentioned in the Bible, will rise. And then they say in that period, uh, those who, who have not had the, uh, who, who did not repent, would be given a second chance to repent. Now, this is why they believe, but unfortunately, all these things cannot be found in the Bible. They may have been repeated by many preachers, but they are simply not found in the Word of God. Here's one of the verses that they use to, su to suggest, I, I call it a suggestion because there's no clear indication that this text is speaking anything to do with, uh, with the saints being taken up into heaven. Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon, thee, upon all the earth, to try them that dwell upon the earth. The key point that I've highlighted there is kept the word, <laughs> which is very contradictory already because the verse is talking about people who keep the word. But we've already seen that just by looking at the idea of the rapture, it's not found in the word at all. So how, do, how would they even use this text to prove anything? But that's besides the point. This, this verse is speaking of how God will protect his people. Now, when he says from temptation, you would think that it means that God won't allow this temptation or tribulation that will fall upon the earth to reach these people. But that's not biblical. When you look at all the stories in the Bible, starting with Abraham, everyone, God always protected his people through trials and tribulations. The Bible clearly says we must, with much trial and tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. But Jesus himself clarifies this. Because again, this is Jesus speaking to the church of Sardis, uh, found in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus clarifies this in John 17, 6. When he's praying for his church notice he was not just praying for his disciples he says in the prayer i do not just pray for these alone but for those who will believe because of their word jesus says in john 17 6 have i have manifested thy name unto unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world thine they were and thou gavest them me and they kept and they have kept thy word this is a characteristic of the people of god in all ages they keep god's word jesus told his disciples now you are clean through the word i have spoken unto you uh, that's found in john 15. abide in me and my let my word abide in you so shall you be called my disciples and you bear much fruit John 17, 6 uh, nails it. He says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. Jesus does not pray for, for God to take his church. Now, when he says his church, we understand that he was not just praying for his disciples. He was praying for the church from hence then, from that time moving on. 
I pray, Lord, do not cause Jesus predicted there will be so much evils, there will be a tribulation. But in his prayer, the final prayer, he says, Lord, I, I know what will happen on this earth, but I do not ask you to take them out of this world, but keep them from the evil. That is the principal focus of, of a Christian. Now, here's a quote that explains more into the rapture theory, really, because it's not biblical. Most rapturous literature mentions the seven-year tribulation period without offering any Bible proof or explanation. And millions have assumed that it must be so well documented that no proof is needed. In fact, the opposite is true. There the just isn't any evidence to give. If you have that evidence, feel free to forward and we're going to review that. But it's not found in the Word of God. Now, note the following verses that just contradict anything to do with secrecy in regards to the return of Jesus Christ. When he returns in, in Revelation 6.16, uh, people will say the wicked that is follow us and hide, um, speaking to the rocks rather, follow us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That was very powerful. Normally when you think of a lamb, you think of this animal that's, you know, humble and meek. But one day, the lamb is going to have wrath. And that's when Jesus removes his, his priestly, priestly uh, robe and wears his robe of vengeance and judgment. That day is near, friends. And we have to be ready. But in our being ready, we are not to be confused. We are not to be motivated by false doctrines. Because that will not prepare us truly. So this will be a great day. No one will be able to stand. It says. Jesus speaking to his return. Which is literally connected to the end of, of, of the age. Uh, that's according to the context in Matthew 24. Jesus says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Every eye shall see him. Even those who pierced him, even those who crucified him will see him. It will be visible, audible. Everyone will see him. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see when they shall uh, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, not with silence and secrecy, but with power and great glory. And Matthew twenty four thirty one, he shall send his angels with a great sound. Why do we miss this sound and trumpet and voice? And why are we missing these verses? And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, uh, from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. This is clearly at the time when Christ comes to gather his saints, at the last day. And of course, there's so many verses we can go into. The point is, there's no scriptural evidence for such a teaching. Uh, moving on about the idea of there being a second chance. That's not found in the Bible uh, either. Jesus says when he returns, those, uh, there'll be a moment when those who are filthy remain filthy. Those who are righteous remain righteous. It will be done then. When probation, probation closes, there's no, no other chance. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is, is with me. Evidently, probation closes just prior to the second advent. The idea that we are once saved, always saved, is not biblical at all. The idea that there's a second chance is not biblical at all. So, in conclusion, he, he's my, my, my concern as a, as a Bible student, and of course as one who is studying the Word of God, is that there's three great grave dangers that you face when you believe in this doctrine. 
the first idea was thinking that you have a second chance. When the Bible clearly says there is no second chance for those who refuse Jesus Christ. So that will lead you to live a life of, of, of sin because you think you will have a second chance, but actually there is no second chance. If you do not repent of your sin, you are going to die because the wages of sin is death. But the beauty is the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. Why don't you receive it? Why wait for a second chance that doesn't even exist? And the other, other concern or danger that you might fall into, you're in, you're in danger of receiving the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 says, there will be those who receive the mark of the beast. Those who receive the mark of the beast, their names will not be found in the book of life. Here's, here's what I mean. So the, the, the uh, rapturists teach that uh, during the seven period, seven year period rather, that's when the Antichrist will show up. And that's when he'll force people to receive the mark of the beast. But according to the rapturists, the church won't be here. The church will be raptured away somewhere in some, in, in, in some location. So in that case, they cannot receive the mark of the beast, it seems. But when you read the Bible in Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says he causes all, everyone, to, uh, to uh, receive the mark of the beast. And if they don't do that, they can't buy or sell or do anything really in terms of business transactions. So you end up being, because biblically the mark of the beast is identified as a power that will rise at a time when God's people are here. And that time is coming, friends. And we're going to talk about more about the mark of the beast. In fact, if you want to learn about the mark of the beast, just click the video right here and you're going to be directed uh, at a place where you can study in-depth biblical truth about what is the mark of the beast and how to avoid it. The mark of the beast is real, it will happen, and you need to know about it because it, it's one of those gravest warnings given in the Bible. The Bible says in, in Revelation 14 that if any man receive the mark of the beast, he shall receive. You remember the wrath that we, we, we saw, uh, the lamb having wrath? He shall receive the wrath of God. The, la the seven last plagues. And, and finally, of course, when you believe in, in, in such a doctrine as this, is that you are in danger of being misled by other false doctrines. The reason being, this doctrine is not found in the Bible. And so every other doctrine that just sounds okay will be, because clearly the reason why this idea of rapture was introduced is to you know, present this idea that the church is safe, God loves his, his church so much, he will just rapture them away so that they don't see the seven last plagues and the trials that will happen on this, on this earth. Yes, we are promised that God will protect his people, but God did, does not teach that he will protect them as in their absence or in their absence. God always leads his people through trials and tribulations to build up their characters so that they be more like him. And so thank you so much, friends. If you have any questions, be free to forward them or to comment them, however you do it. But beware that there are false doctrines out there and you have to always be rooted in the word of God alone. Not your pastor, not your priest, but the word of God.